All right, well, uh, welcome everyone. My name is Thomas Herman. I'm the director of the Medieval Institute here at the University of Notre Dame. I'm happy to see you all on what might be the last nice day of the year here in South Bend. I'm glad that so many of you have decided to come inside anyway to be part of uh, this occasion. Every year, usually in the fall, um, one of the crucial events that we offer is the Matthews Lecture in Byzantine Studies, a, a lecture series that was endowed by the family of Constantine, Ma uh, the Reverend Constantine Matthews uh, in his honor. Reverend Matthews received a master's degree in theology here in the 1970s and his family, uh, and we're very grateful for this, established this endowment uh, to remember him and to further visiting studies here at the University of Notre Dame. Um, at this point, I'm going to call on my colleague from the History Department, Alexander Beihammer, to come up and introduce our speaker. Welcome, Alex. Uh, hello, everybody. So I'm a uh, Haydn Family College professor Byzantine history, the history department, and it is a really great pleasure, pleasure for me to uh, introduce to you tonight our speaker, Theodora uh, Antonopoulou. Uh, it's also a great sort of uh, personal uh, pleasure for me to have you here. We, I think we have known each other almost since childhood, isn't it? I mean, it's really a long time back uh, in the 90s that it sort of crossed paths in uh, Vienna. And it's great to have her here tonight. So uh, Theodora is um, a professor of Byzantine literature at the Faculty of Philology at the National and Capodistrian uh, University of Athens. And uh, she has been teaching there since 2008. Before that, uh, she spent some years in Cyprus, then in Patras, and uh, then uh, she was elected at the University of Athens, which is certainly the most important uh, center of um, Byzantine studies in Greece. And before that, uh, she uh, had her uh, so master's degree and then her uh, doctoral studies at Oxford Lincoln College, uh, where her supervisor was uh, Sir Lomango, one of the really legendary figures in, in, in Byzantine studies. And so, um, as uh, Cyril Mango was both a great archaeologist but also a great philologist, uh, she then uh, developed there her interests, wide uh, field and range of uh, research interests in Byzantine literature, rhetoric, homiletics, hagiography, ethnography, poetry, uh, grammatical uh, studies, and so on. So, really uh, broad. Uh, range of, of um, uh, areas in, in, in the wider field of Byzantine uh, philology, also of course including uh, comicology, paleography, and uh, a general interest also in the classical uh, tradition of Byzantium. Um, more specifically, uh, perhaps the yeah, most important man in her Life after her husband, of course, <laughs> who is uh, um, Amphilosius Papa Thomas, a very famous papyrologist, is uh, Emperor Leon VI. <laughs> and uh, this has to do with the fact that Leon VI not only had four wives, but was also the wise. Huh? He was a very prolific writer and, and lawgiver, perhaps after Justinian, the most important lawgiver in Byzantium. And uh, he had a huge collection, among many other things, of homilies. And so uh, Theodora's dissertation was uh, about the homilies of um, Emperor Leo VI. Uh, sort of preliminary <laughs> study uh, was published, sort of part of her dissertation uh, in 97. And then about 10 years later, she published uh, a new edition of all the homilies of uh, uh, Emperor Leon and the Corpus, uh, Christ uh, Corpus Christianorum and the Greek series of the Corpus Christianorum, uh, volume 63, a really impressive uh, work, 230 pages introduction, uh, 689 pages of text, and really a uh, <coughs> tremendous amount of work. Uh, everyone else would have stopped there and would said, okay, I'm sitting now on my laurel reef for the rest of my life, <laughs> but not Theodora. Theodora continued with many other things, 
Um, after that, she then turned towards uh, Mercurius, the grammatician, and, and published in uh, 2017 uh, the um, uh, Yandic works of this grammatician, so it turned towards a different direction. And then, quite recently, along with a colleague uh, from Greece, uh, Polemis, uh, she also published a sort of um, saint's life, historical text, uh, the life and miracles of uh, Saint Christodoulos of Patmos uh, in the Corpus Fontium Historic Byzantina uh, series, and even more recently, uh, in, in 23, the funerary speech, now coming back to Leo uh, VI, Leo the Wise, which is dedicated to the parents of, of Leo, if they actually were the parents, it's a complicated thing, uh, <laughs> Basin and uh, Evdokia. So, uh, apart from that, of course, numerous other publications and um, lots of activities. I don't uh, want to bother you with that, because today Theodora will speak about religion, politics, and identities in Byzantium, aspects of medieval Greek, Please, Greek, not Roman, huh? Homilies. Theodora, <laughs> please. Well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Professor Berman. Thank you, uh, Professor Weinhauer, Alex. Uh, indeed, we have known each other for ages. Uh, if only the 90s were our childhood. <laughs> 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 Uh, also, thank you very much for mentioning my uh, doctoral father, uh, Professor Silic Mango. Uh, I think it was uh, a great memorial, uh, the reaction to his uh, name. Um, I would uh, uh, like now uh, to begin with the uh, homily, but before, <laughs> my homily. <laughs> but before that, dear colleagues, students and friends, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to warmly to thank the Medieval Institute of the University of Notre Dame and its Byzantine Committee for their kind invitation to give the third annual Matthews Byzantine Lecture. Many thanks are also due to the Matthews family whose generosity made my trip to Athens possible. Uh, this is my first visit to your esteemed university. Uh, however, my first contact with it dates from the days of my postgraduate studies at Oxford when I first requested to receive the via and prompt help from the Medieval Institute regarding the microfilm in its Simon collection. My talk today concerns Byzantine homiletics, an area of research to which I have devoted much of my scholarly work over many years. I should also mention that the handout is for tomorrow's graduate seminar, not for today's uh, <laughs> lecture, uh, but, but still I might find it useful. Uh, the terms homilies and homiletics are derived from the ancient Greek word homilia, which had a variety of meanings related to company, association, conversation, and so on. As an adjective and a term designating an art, it occurs in Pluto, where it denotes the art of conversation. Nevertheless, the term homiletics in the modern sense of the rhetorical art of delivering homilies, that is, religious ecclesiastical discourses, does not seem to exist in Byzantium. The overarching literary sound for homilies was that of rhetoric. Homilies, or sermons, usually followed the great models of the church fathers of the 4th and 5th centuries. Their primary faction in Byzantium, as in the rest of the Christian world, past and present, was the religious instruction of the people. The importance of all the logos of the world was central to homilies, in the sense of Christ as the living word and the divine words of the Bible, but also as the spoken and written word in general. Uh, for this reason, I have chosen this particular illustration, a depiction of the Second Ecumenical Council from the famous Byzantine Codex of the late 9th century, where the logos, in the shape of the book, takes the central stage on the throne. And you can see this is uh, the homilies of uh, Gregory the Theologian of uh, now in Paris. Uh, there is yet another element in this illustration, which was crucial not only for promises, but also for homilies, the participants. Ecclesiastical rhetoric was delivered before an audience, the congregation gathered in a church or monastery. Many homilies were written originally with the intention of being used in liturgical context, 
that is in church services. This was especially true for Christian homilies and encomium saints, whereas other homilies were less suitable for a parish congregation during the liturgy, matins, or vespers, and were most probably designed for reading on various other occasions in a church or monastery. The audience was not a passive one, as one might think, perhaps seeing the detail uh, here, this, you can see uh, a modern rendering of a male audience by a Greek uh, artist, uh, Tassos, uh, but uh, from uh, uh, back in the 19, uh, in 1970. Um, the audience was not a passive one, uh, although it was more vociferous in the patristic period than in later medieval times. During the Byzantine period, preaching activity was primarily performed by clergymen, though lay people were occasionally involved. Homilies were written and preached by most of the notable Byzantine ecclesiastical personalities. Such homilies are typically preserved in a polished formal style that follows the antique rhetorical tradition and may reflect the text of the original delivery. Following their first performance, Successful homilies were incorporated into various homiletic and biographical collections, commonly attested in liturgical manuscripts from the 8th to 9th centuries onwards, and served mainly as liturgical readings in churches and monasteries. As homilies were progressively separated from their original context of production, they acquired a distinct perennial character, which served them well when used by succeeding generations. A closer examination of medieval Greek homilies reveals that they also served other functions that appear to have little or no connection to the Christian message in the strict sense. Specific topics can be identified that challenge their apparent compatibility. <coughs> as far as we can judge from the preserved material, these topics show the impact of historical circumstances and cultural trends on preacher sermons. Homilies were inextricably related to the historical processes in the Eastern Roman Empire, which they reflected and to which they contributed to some extent. The vast audiences of the homilies facilitated the zone's social, political, and cultural function, functions, deepening its relationship with secular rhetoric and furnishing it with a role considerably more significant than previously recognized. I will start by showcasing how preaching could be interwoven with politics in Byzantium. For this purpose, I have chosen some characteristic examples. The first example is linked to iconoclasm. The vicious struggle between opponents and supporters of the veneration of icons in the 8th and the first half of the 9th centuries. In particular, it concerns preaching against the ruling emperor during the first half of the 9th century, that is, in the second phase of the conflict. In general, open or tacit criticism of an emperor, orthodox or heretical, even or dead, is rare, but not entirely absent from surviving homilies. Open criticism has been preserved in the surviving versions of homilies in cases where opponents of specific imperial policies eventually prevail, most notably following iconoclasm. Iconoclasm itself exemplifies how homilies would have occasionally served as vehicles of ecclesiastical politics while simultaneously opposing imperial policies that impacted the church. Iconoclasm was marked by a violent imperial intrusion in ecclesiastical affairs and Christian dogma. It can be argued that within this framework, preaching to the people, along with monastic catechesis, which also fall under the umbrella of homilies, emerged as an effective means of combating a heretical emperor alongside other, perhaps more well-known means of expression, notably treatises, letters, and verses. The sermons of St. Joseph the Studite, twice Metropolitan of Thessaloniki, and you can see the dates here, and twice the post, offer an especially strident example of ecclesiastical attacks on a reigning emperor in front of the congregation. Joseph, along with his famous brother, St. Theodore the Studite, was a protagonist of the second Icon class, and two of his four exiles occurred during that period. Only three homilies written by him exist. The preacher expounds the Icon of doctrines and raves not only against the certain Icon class in general, but also 
specifically against the iconoclast emperor Leo V and his followers. These homilies form a cycle that must have contributed greatly to Joseph's turbulent tenure of office, playing a critical role in his exiles. Uh, more specifically, Joseph launched an explicit public attack against the emperor in his encomium on Saint Demetrius. Delivered in Thessaloniki on the Feast of the Saint, most likely on October 26, 814. The obstinate preacher stitched together a succession of scathing portrayals of the emperor, whom he addressed in the second person. <coughs> According to the specific passage, which you can see here, the emperor was impious, Christ hated, most tyrannical, reigned by the evil one, irreverent, blasphemous, a dreadful heresiac of a demonical heresy, a god hater, a lover of wickedness, of his insanity, and an enemy of the truth who did not deserve to be wearing the imperial garment. One cannot but be started at the acrimonious language that the prelate used against the reigning emperor. In his other two homilies on the cross on Palm Sunday, the situation more or less is similar. Joseph, an obviously uncompromising man, used the anger to fight iconoclast and its proponents. <coughs> his texts make it clear that such attacks might easily be part of Eastern homilies in a liturgical framework, with no special justification for the violent language adopted. Unfortunately, the reactions of the congregation in this case are unknown. <coughs> It may appear astonishing that such works have come down to us without, without suffering the loss of their extensive contemporary references. However, the image of the by all means orthodox prelate at work emerges in these homilies, showing him to be a good shepherd responsible for the protection of the spiritual cloak, who used his power of language to fence off doctrinal enemies, regardless of whether this was the emperor himself or whether he was jeopardizing his own well-being. The second issue of my presentation is a positive expression of political, more specifically imperial ideology in homilies and their role in disseminating it. While Byzantine political ideology in its various manifestations was the focus of excellent studies by eminent Byzantinists in the past, homilies used to largely remain outside or in the margin of relevant investigations. This was so because the existence of the political message in these religious texts by excellence is not self-evident. Although, generally speaking, Byzantine homilies do not tell us something about the essence of the political ideology of the empire that we do not already know from elsewhere, it cannot be stressed enough how significant this honor is for the study of various ideological issues, not only in Byzantine, but also in the Norman Kingdom of Sicily. In this context, we should keep in mind that homilies was a were a very effective and far-reaching medium of political propaganda, that is, of imperial propaganda or of civil propagation of the imperial idea. Due to their wide audience, ranging from the common people to the upper strata of society to the emperors himself, and including both laymen and, and, and uh, ecclesiastics, the ideology contained in them assumed a special role in the political ideological formation of the audience. For example, still in the 9th century, we encounter Photios, Patriarch of Constantinople, and one of the most influential figures in Byzantine history and culture. Here you can see Photios in his old age. It's uh, the old one here. Photios' 19 surviving homilies date from his first period in office and thus from the reign of Emperor Michael III of the Amorian dynasty and now it reads a source of imperial ideology, namely of the various elements of the imperial idea. In them we encounter the quintessential features of the emperor as God representative on earth, which reflect the long traditions of the Greek mirror of princes and imperial oratory. Photos' views are particularly important given especially the influence he exercised on the emperors of the time, Michael III, Basil I, Leo VI. Notably, he also composed a famous letter to the newly baptized Boris Michael of Algeria, the second part of which is paralytic in character and concerns the qualities Boris Michael should possess as a Christian ruler. Here, suffice it to, pre suffice it to present briefly a characteristic and well-known case 
Photos is homing intent on the inauguration of the pilot time church, that of the Theotokos of the Pharos. The oration was pronounced in 1864 in the presence of Michael III and Caesar Bardas, who was second in rank after the emperor. It contains an extensive description of the church accompanied by the homing of the emperor and the Caesar. At the beginning of the oration, the emperor of wisdom is stressed for a large audience which has gathered for the inauguration, including the Senate and bishops. Michael is called the instigator and wise architect of the celebration, you can see that here, who had preconceived in his soul the forms of those things, namely the church. This is a platonic reference appropriate for a wise king, and then in his, in his great wisdom created them. <coughs> Podius addresses him as most loving most Christ loving and pious of emperors surpassing all his predecessors. Then he refers to the emperor's military and foreign policy accomplishments, his building activity, and his concern for the prosperity of his people. Mighty, says the preacher, is the all embracing eye of the universe. At the end of the oration, the emperor is addressed again as among, the, among emperors most blessed and beloved of God. And mention is made once again of his wisdom, but also of the expectations that he ruled with truth, meekness, and righteousness, and this is a reference to the Psalms. Podius stresses that the emperor was destined from the cradle to rule over the God's people under God's guidance. He goes on to praise the Caesar, whom the emperor took as partner and sharer of the imperial dignity for the salvation of his subjects. It is through both of them that the Holy Trinity extends to all her providence, steers wisely, and governs her subjects. On the whole, the divine providence of imperial power, the qualities of rulership of the Christian emperor, especially justice and the concern for his people, his building activity and his triumphs over the enemies, his piety and role in the salvation of God's people, the participation of the emperor in the world of ideas, the belief in God's wisdom and architecture of the universe, the, vi the very idea of the Ecumeni, that is, the inhabited world which is identified with the empire, are essential constituents of the imperial idea. In his homilies, Photius took every opportunity to promote among his audience and before the emperor and the highest authority authorities of the state the idea of the ideal Christian emperor. In this context, we should keep in mind that that what I mentioned earlier about uh, the use uh, of uh, Greek homilies also in the Norman Kingdom uh, or for Sicily. Uh, nowhere is the role of homilies as a medium of political and ideological correctness made more, more clearly, more clear, you know, made clear, than in those homilies of the Byzantine tradition which were preached outside the empire. This is the case with the monk Philagathos Kerameus, who lived in the Norman kingdom of Sicily in the, and preached in the 12th century. He preached in Calabria, especially in the Archbishopric of Rosano, and in various places in Sicily, including uh, Palermo, the Byzantine Panormos. Uh, his reputation as an orator even led him to preach before the Rex, that is, in the presence of King Roger II. Uh, his texts are an unequivocal. Uh, unequivocal testimony to the fact, also known from other sources, that the Byzantine tradition of imperial ideology was to some extent continued in the empire's former Italian territories, where the Byzantine emperor <coughs> had been substituted by the Norman kings. <coughs> Philagathos uses uh, the Byzantine terms Basileus, Basileus and Basileia Basilia, uh, applied to the Norman kings, and even uses the term autocrator, autocrator, emperor, which stresses the imperial status of the Norman ruler and prays to the cross to empower our faithful emperors, that's his words, so that they can defeat against, uh, again, his words, the godless Ismailites. Um, it inspires that, in principle, these texts could have been preached anywhere in the Byzantine Empire, presenting the same imperial ideology as Byzantine homilies in general. Leaving aside specific historical references, and if the author was unknown, we would not be able to guess that he was writing outside the empire. The preacher conveys to his Italo-Greek audience a sense of continuity with the Byzantine past. 
But in this, he makes no reference either to the change of rulers in Sicily and southern Italy or to the religious schisma. For him, it was enough that the rulers were Christians, especially in the face of the, in the, face of the external enemy. Back to Byzantium itself, it may well be argued that the existence of a political message, which was inherent in a large part of ancient oratory, found an appropriate outlet in the ecclesiastic rhetoric of medieval times. Admittedly, such a faction was present only to a limited extent, and what is more, it had nothing to do both in principle and originally with the Christian religion which these texts served. However, at least some of the preachers were eager to employ in their sermons messages in the service of political, specifically imperial orthodoxy, which went far beyond the standard prayer for the well-being of the emperor. Such an approach was apparently accepted and certainly tolerated, since it was usually veiled in a religious attire of some sort. Actually, homilies constituted the most convenient vehicle for the dominant political ideology to be transferred to the masses and be reinserted for the elites, which formed part of the audience. The solemn religious environment in which they were preached assured that their messages were imprinted on the minds of the listeners. Significantly, we witness a way of the process of formation of the people's political ideology by those responsible for their spiritual guidance. Therefore, homies is emerged as one of the few medieval legal exams that bring us directly to the world of the people at large. This statement also applies to the other major issue of this presentation, which is what homies tell us about identity issues. I will present some aspects or versions of identity, since clearly, the preachers and their audiences possessed multiple identities. In particular, a lively scholarly debate concerning identities in Byzantium, especially the definitions and applications of the latest Greek and Roman, and Alexander hinted at it, uh, is currently taking place. Homilies have yet to play a significant role in this discussion, as scholars mainly rely on lay texts, especially historiography. As a result, the role of homilies in expressing, forming, or transforming Byzantine identity has received little attention. I would like to highlight the fact that middle and late Byzantine homilies can provide some useful and even valuable material, complementing other sources and attesting to the part they played in the perception and formation of their audience's identities. A few examples relating to cultural, linguistic, religious, and civic identities will illustrate the case. So, in middle and late Byzantine homilies, the name Hellenes, Hellenes, Greeks, does not imply ethnicity contemporary with the preachers, but remains an ethnic, religious, or cultural designation of the ancient pagan Greeks. Such a treatment followed in the, in the tradition of early Christian patristic homilies such as Gregory of Nazianzus. For example, the usage occurs repeatedly in his oration of 39 of the Santa Lumina, also in Proclus of Constantinople, John of Damascus, and others. In keeping with this tradition, Emperor Leo VI the, way, the Wise, who reigned you can see, uh, around 900, an outstanding secular preacher, who as emperor used homilies to further imperial ideology and propaganda, Employed the name twice in reference to Greek mythology, in his funeral oration for his parents, that's the topic of tomorrow's uh, seminar, which he delivered in 888 and was included in his collection of homilies. In the passages in question, the author employs the rhetorical technique of comparison, synthesis, which was prescribed for encomium. He compares his father, Emperor Basil I, with Hercules for his bravery and with the Arcus and the Damathis, the mythical judges in the Hades, for his exercise of justice, only to find him superior to the ancient figures regarding these two cardinal virtues. We read which Hercules, whom the Hellenes called the Averter of Evil, cleared the world of the Ikveni, to explain the same for, of iron people as he did, <coughs> and which Arcus or Damathis, whom the Hellenes made judges in the underworld, struggle for justice as he did. The same usage associating things Greek with paganism is found in the 11th century, as attested by the poem of the towering military figure by Fuselos, for example, in his oration on a miracle performed at the Blackerman Church in Constantinople. 
A similar attitude also emerges in a work by another major author and historical personality, Nikiforos Grigorasa, uh, in the first half of, uh, May, uh, of the 14th century. He uh, died between uh, 1358 and 1561. It is the so called life and martyrdom of Maitin Singelos, in reality, a hagiographical and comiastic homily delivered in the presence of an audience of, of the saints' feast, which took place in the Koran Monastery, nowadays uh, in Constantinople, on the occasion of its renovation, which was completed in 1521. The work begins with an extensive reference to the yearly feast of the ancient Greeks, um, such as the Panathenea and the Olympia, the Olympic Games, where they celebrated the deeds of the heroes of the past. References uh, uh, to Solon and Lycurgus, Zeus and Cronus are interspersed in the introductory section. Later, Gregoras argues that Saint Magic had already arrived at the summit of all Greek wisdom, citing grammar, poetry, and astronomy as examples. He rounds off the work by describing, by describing the superiority of the saint in these words. He surpassed our contemporaries and competed against those who were admired among the Greeks. Thus, the encomium includes multiple references to the pagan Greeks and a, compare, and a comparison of the saints with them, this time mingled with almost underlying admiration for Greek wisdom and education. The question of things Greeks, Greek with pagan and non Christian in Byzantine ceremonies occurs down to George Gennadios Scholarios, creator of Constantinople after the Great Conquest in 1453, who nevertheless at the same time used a variety of designations to refer to himself and his contemporaries depending on the context. The passages from Hellions in the homilies are highly conventional in a religious ecclesiastical context and carry the burden of tradition. They bear witness to the zones and indeed the church's conservatism as they maintain the ancient Christian attitudes. It is possible, however, to trace some developments in reaction to changing historical and cultural circumstances. One such trend in homilies concerned the preacher's treatment of ancient Greek heritage. Uh, some, year ago, some years ago, I gathered the pagan mythological material in the homilies of the late 9th and 10th centuries, no less than 200 of them, and addressed the issue of how this material was used in homilies and how its inclusion in them could be justified. I focused on stories that involve pagan gods or legendary heroes as distinct from other literary elements that relate to antiquity. It turned out that relevant mythological material appears in about one tenth of this textual corpus, which is a considerable percentage, especially when realizing that even one of the preachers who employed such material, Euthymius Protasecretis, a lesser preacher of the 10th century, exclaimed with the Apostle Paul, and you can see that I am here. What agreement has the tenth of God with idols? And this is from the second letter of the Corinthians. You can see the names of some of the preachers who employed myths Procopius the Deacon, the Peroli of the Sixth, again, Euthymius, Asenio the Metropolitan of Corfu, Antonius the Mark, and others. And sometimes even myths with daring content make their appearance in homilies as in some sermons on major feasts by Leo VI. For example, in his homily on the Feast of Easter, he employs myths with mainly erotic themes, which concern God or the relationship between God and humans. At first sight, they hardly fit Easter Day, but Leo cleverly uses them to attack pagan feasts for their lack of decency and the folly of their subject matter. Still, in the old edition of another such homily, this time on the presentation of the Lord to the Temple, reproduced in the Patrologia Greca, you will not find the myths as the editor, obviously, the modern editor, obviously felt offended. <laughs> we have to bear in mind that the problem of how to handle the Hellenic heritage persisted as a source of consternation for preachers, even beyond the patristic era, when the matter had been dealt with and to a large extent settled by the Cappadocian fathers. The acceptance of the pagan literary heritage which continued to be taught in education, became an issue during the Byzantine revival of learning that followed the first phase of iconoclasm, particularly during the so-called Macedonian Renaissance, a high point in the history of Byzantine art and culture. 
We should recall that the classicizing elements in the precious arts are mainly in a dozen illuminated manuscripts dating from roughly 880 to the end of the 10th century, as well as in contemporary ivories characterized by Macedonian Renaissance. This phenomenon partly overlapped chronologically with and was influenced by a broader cultural phenomenon, movement, the revival of learning, which took place in Byzantium in the period from around 780, so the rebirth that within a few decades of several classicizing dramas, such as historiography and epigram, encompassed encyclopedias and went on until around the end of the first millennium. The artistic objects connected to the Renaissance display antique features to a varying degree, which go back to late antiquity. Among them, a well-known characteristic is the employment of mythological scenes like the ones you can see here very quickly. This is another famous manuscript, the Paris Psalter from the 10th century. And you can see David as uh, Orpheus, and behind the scene is Melodia, personification of Melody. And uh, here you can see uh, from another uh, manuscript of the 10th century, the giants, uh, in the illustration of Nicander's uh, works. And uh, this is a black and white. You can see uh, it's not the Byzantine Emperor, it's Zeus, blessed as the Byzantine Emperor, mm -hmm. and they're giving birth to the god Dionysus. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, uh, some famous uh, ivory scenes on ivories, uh, a battle scene from uh, the Iliad, uh, the sacrifice of Iphigenia, and the abduction of Europe. The revival of myths and homilies and literature in general in this period uh, is the counterpart of the decoration of manuscripts and other luxury objects with mythological scenes in this period. And comparable to the classicistic trend in art, which gradually dissolved after the 10th century, the catechesis of Simeon the New Theologian in the late 10th and early 11th centuries signified the waning of the literary movement with a return, even though temporarily, to a more introverted and mysticistic tradition of homiletics. In the peculiar use of mythology, in homilies preached inside the liturgical context of the Christian Church, the Eurotus followed the example of early Christian fathers, especially St. Gregory of Nazianzus, again, while taking obvious pleasure in the ancient stories. However, homilies made sure to condemn the paganism outright and to distance themselves from the ethics of the stories, thus keeping themselves within the framework set out by St. Basil of Caesarea, when his famous address to his nephews called to them to read pagan texts but beware of their religious and moral contents. Most importantly, these preachers contributed to the ongoing Christian appropriation of the pagan past at a crucial junction in Byzantine history, just as Byzantium launched an offensive against the Arabs. Thus, preaching helped solidify the cultural identity of the Byzantine people who were the recipients of these texts. Aside from the attitudes described so far, other approaches to the issue of the collective identity of the congregation also appeared in middle and late Byzantine homilies. A new approach, though, focused on the Greek language as a crucial identifier for the preaching and its audience. In homilies, as in other texts alike, the language was designated as Hellenic voice, a last phonic. It became a significant parameter in the attempt of the people of Byzantium to distinguish themselves from others from the 8th century onwards. This viewpoint is apparent in a passage from an encomium of St. Stodulus of Arkmusa, uh, who lived in the 11th century. It was composed around 1200, just before the Fourth Crusade. By a noble called Theodosius Gudelis, Gudelis in Greek, of Byzantium, namely of Constantinople. He was, addressing the he was addressing the monastic community, the same he had founded on the island of the Revelation back in 1088, and his work survives in a single codex, still in the monastery. In this enclosed environment, Theodosius claims that Christodulus enjoyed universal veneration after his death in the following terms. Not only those who boast of this Greek language 
consider Christodoulos as a genuine celebrant of God and a true friend of Christ, but also every Italian and Old Roman and barbarian, likewise every Western Iberian, at least in the Iberian Peninsula, as well as those who inhabit the Italian, modern France, and the island of the Sicilians and all the Ocean Isles, that is the British Isles. So they all came to venerate Christodoulos on Patmos. One notice the description of the Byzantine Empire as the Greek speaking world in contrast to the Western Christian world, which included the Italians, the inhabitants of, Lo of old Rome, as contrasted to New Rome, that is Constantinople, and other peoples of Europe. Thus, Theodosius's us, as opposed to the others, refers to the people of the Empire of New Rome, and that was, of course, the title of uh, Mancus, or then it was spoken by Mancus, and native speakers of the Greek tongue. Fidelis does not differentiate between classicizing and vernacular Greek, regardless of register. He refers to Greek as his and his audience's language. The educated preacher in his monastic audience, perhaps of diverse educational status, who commemorated the founder of the Island Monastery, used language to define their collective identity from that of the rest of the world. As late Byzantium faced new historical challenges that threatened its existence, another approach to identity emerged in the homilies of the period. Being distinct from yet complementary to the linguistic one just described, it once again highlights the role of preaching in expressing and forging the collective identity of the congregation. This approach is furnished by the well known anti unionist theologian and court preacher Joseph Vienius in his corporation on the Holy Trinity. This work belongs to a group of 21 sermons he delivered at the palace in the Church of the Holy Apostles in Constantinople around 1420 during the reign of Manuel II Paleologos. It mainly concerns the Filioque, which was hotly debated then, while the second part deals with the vice of ingratitude, thus combining theological development with a moral component. One finds the traditional equation of Greek with pagan in a mix of Roman and Greek historical figures. His words, go away from our court, you Caesar and Pelkis and Socrates and all the Greek faction, there is no share for you than faithful in the inheritance of the faithful. Well, that's pretty strong language. Yet it is worth drawing attention to the beginning of the homily. In it, Priennius addresses his audience in the following words Beloved men, genuine friends and brothers in Christ, listen to my voice. You are a Romain, Romans by descent, Genos, and Orthodox by faith, pay attention to the words of my mouth. <coughs> This wording is not unique to Briennius, as it may be found, for example, almost identically in Lucas, the historian of the fall of Constantinople in 1453, who talks about the certain Philis, who came from Ephesus, a Roman Romeo by descent, a Christian by faith, a scribe in the palace of the ruler for writing Romaic and Arabic. It is noteworthy that in Lucas' passage, Christian replaces Orthodox, since the distinction is drawn between Christians and Muslims. In addition, the word Romaic designates the vernacular variation of Greek, which began being called in this way to distinguish it from classicizing Greek from the 11th century onwards. It is clear that Briennius used ethnic and religious terms of identity at the beginning of his homily to, his, to remind his audience of their self <coughs> interests and that they belong to the same community. Thus laying the groundwork for building a consensus on the doctrinal issues he was about to present. It is striking to see, on the one hand, how he identified his audience, not by explicitly mentioning the others, as with Elis Hedana, but by using two parameters, descent and orthodoxy. And on the other, how the name Romain, Romans, had changed from denoting universal citizenship in the Roman Empire of the 3rd century AD to denoting ethnicity. Recent biography correctly emphasizes its change. Still, this Roman ethnicity should not be understood as referring to a separate ethnic group that emerged out of nowhere in unpopulated and underpopulated lands from identity stripped all the populations in the Greek and Greek speaking Eastern Mediterranean, or even in direct descent from the ethnic Romans or hence in Rome. 
that is the inhabitant of all growth in the words of Theodore of Budaeus, but in a sense that can be explicated <coughs> as follows. We have looked at some references to the collective identity of the congregation, whether cultural, linguistic, ethnic, or religious, and their difference from the others which appear on occasion in Byzantine homilies. Such mentions appear gradually in homilies from the 9th, but especially from the 12th century, following the renewed, close, and mostly hostile interaction with Western Europeans and the Turkish peoples. While the Roman identity of the preachers and the congregation is not disputed, its constitution was complicated. Long after all subjects of the old Roman Empire had become Roman citizens, the Romans of the Romain, Byzantine period, were the people of the Empire of New Rome, of the Greek language and Orthodox religion, as opposed to the Romans of Old Rome, of the Latin tongue, and after the schism, adherence to the Church of Rome. The Byzantine emperors always insisted on using the identification of the state as Roma for an institutional reason of paramount importance. In this way, they emphasized that their state was the only legitimate continuation of the Roman Empire. In the context of these homilies, therefore, a clear threefold identity emerges for the majority of the people of the Byzantine Empire. The defining criteria of this Byzantine or Romaic ethnic identity as distinguished from the ancient Greek or Latin Roman, were firstly a Greek linguistic and cultural identity resulting from an uninterrupted tradition and education within which a high and low linguistic register can be conserved. Secondly, a religious, Christian, and after the schism, Orthodox identity. And thirdly, a Roman imperial and civic identity which merged with the other two identities both within and outside of the fluctuating boundaries of the Eastern Roman Empire. All three criteria together inform the great majority of the medieval Romeo of the East, hence the, the designation Romeo with the synthesis which modern Greeks have used for themselves. To borrow and adapt the pertinent title of Ericus Miller, Miller's well known 2006 book of the reign of Theodosius II of the Greco Roman world, the Greek Roman Empire, power and belief under Theodosius II, Byzantium as a whole was in its mainstay a Greek Roman <coughs> Empire and moreover a Christian Orthodox one. Actually, I'm not the only one reiterating this concept and our book title, Johannes Coder, the spoken of the Christian Greek Roman Empire, and Rodic Beaton also references the title of Miller's book. Thus far, we have seen that homilies delivered for the people, whether lay or clerical, expressly served to strengthen their sense of identity and ethnicity, particularly in the face of external enemies. In this light, the propagation of imperial ideology in homilies makes perfect sense. <coughs> the final point to be made is that the strengthening of the people's identity also helped reinforce the cohesiveness of the empire. <coughs> Sermons that serve internal missionary activity within the empire's borders are not worth in this respect. Although such homilies may not survive, their uh, historical existence assured by historical and literary references to saintly preachers and hagiographical texts. Nikon Metanoita, you can see the man here, Metanoita meaning to the pain, and then the, during the 10th century is a notable example. The biographer of the famous saint and itinerant preacher repeatedly refers to his preaching of repentance and asserts that Nikon preached the usual. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, not all homilies were delivered in a liturgical context. The biographer attests that Nikon's missionary preaching took place in the open, <coughs> in public spaces, such as in the area of the harbor of Tiberius and all on top of the Calchis fortress on the island of Judea. Following the liberation of the island of Crete from the long Arab rule in 961, Nikon's activity involved the Cretans and later the 40 settlers, namely the Slavs of Laconia and the Peloponnese, which since the, six, since the sixth century had suffered at the hands of Slavs, Bulgars, and Arabs, but which had started recuperating from the ninth century onwards. Although very few of Nikon's actual words survive in his cartographical life, it is beyond doubt that preaching was a powerful means of carrying out his mission. His conduct, which served as a moral compass and the physical chastisement of the unbelievers, 
either by the saint himself or by the divinity in the form of natural phenomena, reinforce the effect of this preaching. The point of this preaching, as with all of Nico's missionary activity in the late 10th century, was very pragmatic. It was to integrate or reintegrate the local provincial populations into the religious life of the empire, thereby striving for the, lay, the ever desired religious and at the same time cultural unification in its interior. To conclude, it becomes obvious that as with the rest of the Greek literary tradition produced during the millennium of the Byzantine Empire, likewise in homilies we must look for changes that occurred over time, despite the existing constants. In the medium late Byzantine period, fresh homilies which were being generated were not fossilized as one might think at first glance, but were adapted to the milieu that produced them. Such a reaction to the circumstances surrounding preachers and listeners was frequently, uh, frequently an intangible, difficult to discern process that took many saves. Homilies were used to express a variety of messages, including religious and ecclesiastical messages, such as on Ironclass, with the Theophilus, and the Hesychas, as well as political, ideological, and identity related messages for the religious, linguistic, cultural, or ethnic. Especially in the 7th to the 10th centuries, the fluidity of boundaries between homilies and political orations is particularly clear. Homilies could, to a varying degree, have some political content, because in that era, there was essentially little other public speaking outside of the church. Already in late antiquity, the civic framework was gradually shifting to the parallel setting of the Christian church, on whose fertile grounds rhetoric flourished throughout the Byzantine era without interruption. Homilies persisted in their role of forging the people's identities, all by depending on the views of individual preachers, until the official end of Byzantium in 1453, and even beyond into the post Byzantine period. The situation is all the more remarkable when we consider that homilies remain a largely conventional zone. Thank you very much for your attention.